then I'm very uh, happy and honored to have a great panel to start us off with. Uh, we have, and I'll just introduce them by name uh, in order that they're going to speak. Fred Hahn with us, who is the president of Keeping Ontario. All right, good, I get to stand. Um, yeah, yeah. Brother Fred was, uh, was with us at Center for Social Justice for many years, but he's been in every activist campaign in Toronto for many years. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, although I haven't been in this beautiful building, which is quite lovely. Um, uh, Kevin did a good job of talking to you a little bit about our organization, but I want to start by introducing myself as uh, Fred Hahn from KP Ontario, and I am a pension expert. And I'm saying that on purpose, because I think I have the most important qualification necessary, particularly for workers in pension plans. I'm a trade unionist. That is the most important qualification absolutely necessary for those of us who are interested in our members' stake in workplace pensions. We have 240,000 members in Ontario in CUPE, and we have every pension arrangement you can imagine under the sun, and, uh, and then we have about 30% of our members that have no pension, workplace pension at all. Uh, so we have folks in jointly sponsored plans like HOOP, the hospital or the healthcare plan of Ontario, and OMERS, the municipal and school boards plan also has child welfare people in it. We have uh, folks in workplace pension plans some of those are defined benefit pension plans, some of those are defined contribution plans. I myself came from an agency here in the city of Toronto, community in Toronto. We had what at the, in the, at the time we called a non-contributory money purchase piece of shit pension plan that <laughs> gave us no real, uh, no retirement security at all. I'm happy to tell you that since that time, folks have negotiated something better in that workplace. Mm -hmm. We also as a union have cre helped to create pension vehicles for people who didn't have access to pension vehicles in their workplaces. Because these plans, I'm sure many of you will know, are restrictive. You have to be a certain kind of person from a certain kind of workplace in order to get access to even potentially join a plan like OMERS. So in community agencies and in child care centers, uh, that was not possible, unless you were a municipal child care worker. But if you were a community-based child care worker, there really wasn't a vehicle for you unless you could develop this independent little plan with you and your 12 co-workers. Like, that's not going to be really pretty viable. So one of the things we did with other unions was create the multi-sector pension plan. It is a target plan, a variant. We also have a, the nursing home and related industries plan, also available to nursing home, uh, mainly long-term care facilities. Those are things that our union has done, but I have to say, like, you know, it's a bizarre world. Uh, while I introduce myself as an expert, I really have only needed to really pay attention to pensions for the last three or four years while I have been president of, uh, of our provincial division. And I have to say, lots of people in the room who are from CUPE have been sort of my teachers in this. Uh, but uh, it is a bizarre world. Uh, we have a long relationship with many plans, but I'll just you know, share a little story about uh, the OMERS pension plan. Some of you in the room may know that our Union actually sued that plan for something that it did. It uh, took our members' money and said it was going to create a separate organization over here to do some of the work. And then it said, well, the same people who run the pension plan are going to be the directors over there. And we're going to give them these big salaries. And we said, it's a bad idea and it won't work and it's not going to make the money, you say. And they did it anyway. And then when it wasn't making the money that we told them it wouldn't make, they then folded it and brought it back in house. This sounds like a good thing, right? except that the directors, the same people, by the way, right? Same people, <laughs> uh, uh, had contracts. So they got paid out lots of money from the pension plan uh, because their you know, arrangement folded early. And so we decided to sue them. And it was quite revolutionary at the time and quite nerve wracking for our members. And there were some members who were honestly saying, wait a second, are we suing ourselves? Like, what are we doing? Like, is this the right thing to do? And we democratically debated it at a convention and we decided that we would do it because of the principle that millions of dollars of our members' hard-earned money that they put into that pension plan went to line the pockets of three or four white dudes who were in front of the pension plan and that didn't seem fair to us. It didn't seem like it should be legal, frankly. <laughs> and then I discovered, having been part of that process, that in fact it is very legal. <laughs> in fact, it's done all the time. In fact, they were probably more ethical than most companies on Bay Street. <laughs> and so it is this, oh, it's, a, it's not only a low bar, like, what to, uh, I want to shower just after listening to Kevin, never mind sitting in those rooms. <laughs> so we are constantly in this, there's the principles that we might hold 
as trade unionists. And the reality of the circumstances that we are part of when we are in pension plans that conduct themselves in the kind of capitalist economy that we have, you know? I mean, the, the forum is called, you know, from socialism to capitalism, it's kind of interesting because really, like, we're kind of in both things. I mean, pension plans, whether they're workplace pension plans, social pension plans, they're pooling people's resources to try and look after people. I mean, that's a, in some ways a vaguely socialist principle, but they're also reliant on money making money. Like, we're doing nothing except being money, which is a very capitalist principle, right? So it is a murky world. This whole thing is murky. And it's why, you know, uh, one of the things I, in preparing, I, I, you know, thinking about some questions, right? Like, I mean, what does our union, for example, want to gain from having some measure of control by way of trustees and jointly sponsored plans? Because we actually fought for more than a decade to have the municipal plan owners not be controlled by government, but jointly sponsored. It's like, why did we do that? What do we think we are going to gain from that? Clearly, we want to gain control. You know, in the owner's pension plan under Mike Harris, they, he just uh, said, well, there's going to be a contribution holiday for everybody. Mm -hmm. he, he was able to do that. The pension plan's in a bit of trouble right now. It's not fully funded. And in, that is in no small part due to the fact that it was robbed of contributions for a long, long time because the government decided it would be so. So we want to control over those funds. But we also wanted, you know, the ability to have some power in that plan, to extend it to other workers who might not have the benefit of being able to access a pension. And to think about how do we use our members' money, right? Like, how is this money used? Can it be used to do some things that are good? And of course, there's also real issues around transparency. The reason I introduced myself as a pension expert is because I just came from our National Executive Board where we spent several hours talking about pension challenges we're facing as an organization across the country, and there are lots of them. And, you know, I was remarking uh, to a colleague earlier today that everyone started the discussion by apologizing. You know, I'm not really a pension expert, but I don't really know much about pensions. I mean, I've only been doing it for about six or seven years, but, you know, I've only been sitting on the pension trust, you know, in my, in Saskatchewan for eight years, but, but, so I'm not an expert, but, uh, like, screw that. Like, you know what? I mean, it is kind of crap that we are, as workers, always told we're not good enough, we're not smart enough, we can't understand this stuff, it's far too complicated for you poor little workers, like you can't figure out this investment stuff, God forbid. We need professionals, we need experts. In fact, it's what we're facing, like how did the teacher's plan get into the place that it's in? I, I don't want to speak on behalf of them, but I'll offer an opinion. It's because they went to an expert board. I know the leaders of the teacher's affiliates. I know many of the members who are teachers in that plan. They wouldn't want their money buying this for-profit child care center in the UK, but they have virtually no control insofar as they've ceded it to experts who are telling them, this is what you must do. Your plan's in trouble. You've got to make money. This is how you're going to make money. It's all about money. And we're facing a challenge like that, in particular at Omers, who have just now uh, or recently made a decision that, uh, you know, we are one of the sponsor organizations in Omers, QP. We have about 40% of the membership uh, of all of the plan members in Omers. 40% of them are members of our union. And so as a sponsoring organization in this governance structure, we have uh, people that we can appoint to various boards. And the legislation, the legislation that enacted this jointly sponsored plan gives me <laughs> the power, <laughs> as the president of KP Ontario, to name the trustees. I pick you, right? Or whomever. But in fairness, we weren't really ready for that. I mean, we didn't really have tons of great training. Kevin and others have been trying hard to do more training in our organization. But really, we're scratching the surface there. And we often set people into the den of the lion, as it were, without a lot of preparation. Uh, regardless, uh, uh, my ability to choose people has now been severely limited. Because it's not just up to me to pick anymore. Uh, they now have to go through a test. And then you have to meet a standard. Now, the standard, when you read it on paper, actually doesn't look that insurmountable. But there's a wish list on top of that, you see, a gap analysis. So it's not just knowing something about pensions and having been 
part of a board, but now it'd be really good if you had international investment uh, financial experience, which you know most school board custodians I find have. <laughs> um, it's quite remarkable to me. Uh, and so we're in the midst, right now in the middle of this challenge of uh, an expert board, and I want to be really clear about this, and I say it with a lot of uh, support from and uh, an understanding from our members, many of whom are in the room, that we feel very strongly, uh, you know, people who pay into a pension plan, it's their money. They must have their own representatives who are members of that plan, who are able to represent them, us, in that plan. Uh, and so, you know, uh, people will then say, well, look, what do you do? when your pension plan, you know, is invested in something that's kind of embarrassing. There's a bunch of examples, and the most recent one that you may have, I'm sure most of you will have heard of in Toronto was the Porter Airlines strike. Omers was a, is a, the single largest sing, uh, investor in Porter Airlines Corporation or board or whatever the, whatever the corporate name is. And in fact, we have, the pension plan has a representative who sits on the board of directors of that organization. And so, uh, you know, I, I want to start by saying, like, that wasn't necessary. It's not about whether that was embarrassing or not. Don't forget, this is a jointly sponsored plan. It's not like we make every decision, right? Like we said, yeah, hmm, that'd be a good idea. And frankly, in that circumstance, I would like to believe that had we found out about the challenge before it got to a place where they were on strike for a couple weeks, because that's literally what happened, <laughs> they were on strike for a couple weeks before I even realized, or anyone seemed to realize, that Omers was an investor, we might have been able to do something more positive there. And the reason I say that is because there are exact, there are indeed examples of that. So, Omers manages property like, for example, the Scarborough Town Center. The cleaners in the Scarborough Town Center are organized by the Service Employees International Union. The, their contract comes up and the Scarborough Town Center, which is really run by the, a realty wing of Omers says, your, your contract's too expensive, so we're gonna, you know, let go of it, and we're gonna go get, uh, go for another bid, and you're a lot of jobs. And so the SEIU, thankfully, before it became a big thing, a firm decision, before the end date of the contract, called us and said, hey, like, this is owners, can you do something about it? And we did enlist our trustees, one of whom's in the room, and others, to go and talk with the CEO of the plan and intervene, and in fact, they did intervene. And in fact, they did reinstate that contract. And in fact, those workers were able to retain those jobs. There, is thing, there are things we can do like that if we have the uh, belief that it is partly our, part of our obligation to do it. Uh, and if we have the wherewithal and the knowledge and the time to spend to do it. Um, you know, I, I started to talk a little bit about um, about these expert boards and this con this problem uh, that is, I think, facing us. Because as Kevin said, look, uh, the world is changing rapidly around investments. Ca you know, capitalism's gone through a crisis. Everything's being restructured. Everything's being restructured, including the way investments happen, including the way pension plans operate. And so there is this enormous pressure to get workers out of the way and to put international financiers in charge of these plans so that they can be more free to invest and make more money. And we really have to figure out a way to be elbows up about that. Uh, we have to make sure, for example, from our union's perspective, there's a real issue of representation here. 70% of the members of CUPE who are members of OMERS are women. We should have women sitting around that table representing women who are our members of that plan. It's, you know, uh, there are a significant number of our members who are from various kinds of backgrounds and ethnicities. We can't just have all white guys sitting around making decisions. That's not okay. That's not representative of the members in the plan. So when we're talking about members being represented, we have to be clear about the equality lens that we're applying to that question of representation. But there also has to be accountability back. We've built a structure where the trustees in Omers, for example, on an annual basis at our convention, report to members of the plan. Any member can come. You don't have to be coming to the convention. You don't even have to be you know, a part of QP Ontario because we have a lovely structure where you can choose to not be part of your union, but I digress. Um, so uh, uh, you can just show up. You're a member of the pension plan. 
you can show up and you can hear from your trustees. It's an accountability structure we built in, right? But this goes to this question of fiduciary duty, and I just got to say, as a pension expert, I think the way that fiduciary duty gets used is total BS. It gets used to shut our people down, to make them feel like they cannot talk to their union. I think we have a job to do in our movement of helping people to redefine fiduciary responsibility as being responsible to the members of the plan by way of saying, I'm responsible, in our example, to public sector workers who work in schools. Therefore, I'm not going to allow our plan to invest in P3 schools as one example, and there are many more. We need to arm our people. So when I talked a little bit about our minimal training that we've been able to provide for people, we now recognize and are in the process of stepping that up, because we have to. We have to arm our people with an understanding of their role and their obligation as trade unionists when they go into a plan where they are surrounded by and getting advice from people who are not trade unionists and people who will have very different opinions about how things should work, right? It is unfair of us to just send them off into the wilds and expect that they might not get acculturated to a different culture than is ours as working people. So we must be able to do that, but we must also maintain contact with them. We have a reference group in Omers as an example. There's a similar structure, as I understand, for healthcare workers, where our trustees actually are, come back and talk to people who are members, not necessarily uh, actively, in, but they're members of the pension plan. We, we talk about stuff so that they have a touchstone with members in the union who they are representing in the plan. Um, it, is a, it is a really big challenge because I'll tell you, that is not the way they define fiduciary responsibility, right? Uh, they say that it is about us, not our reps not being able to tell us stuff. Uh, but here's the thing, like, we're not the ones sitting around those tables making side deals about business, right? Like our reps. We're not the ones who are going to be in danger of insider trading or other things. Like, we're not, and nor should we ever think that we must be bound by their definition of fiduciary responsibility when we have a principal duty to working people in these arrangements. Uh, so look, um, I'm going to try and be quick about defined benefit pension plans, and I, I just, uh, look, there's a huge attack, Kevin was talking a little bit about it, um, and I think we're not doing enough. And I think we're not doing enough for a couple reasons. And maybe this is because I was raised Catholic and I'm a homosexual, but I, there's, a, there's a guilt thing that happens, eh? We feel guilty that we have pensions and our neighbors don't. We feel like we have something that they don't. We, our members have bought in to the lies of the right wing, and they feel a little guilty about having these gold-plated pension plans. Now, I should tell you, right, the, the definition of gold-plated, like the average owner's pension is, I think, at seventeen dollars or $18,000 a year, after paying in for 35 years, by the way. So if that's a gold plate, boy, oh boy. <laughs> and I mean, what we've been doing is a little bit, we've begun an education inside of our membership to do a compare and contrast, for example, with, you know, Rogers Telecommunications, who have their own defined benefit plan. Oh yeah, just for the CEO, eh? And a couple of top managers. And they get, well, they believe in defined benefit plans, but it's for themselves, trust me. <laughs> they don't have one for their workers, but for themselves, oh, you betcha. Um, we need to be able to talk to people about this, to move away and unburden uh, our members' minds of this garbage that they are surrounded by much more than they are our messaging on these plans. And we have to be able to talk also to our neighbors about it. I got invited to a forum in, uh, in Waterloo. There was this guy, Bill Tufts, some of you may know him, He's a, his, uh, his whole raison d'etre, it seems, is to say that pension plans, particularly public sector pension plans, are terrible, cash cows that are starving municipalities of resources and whatever, and he's got all these lovely charts and graphs. Of course, what he really is is an investor, eh? What he really wants is the ability to invest your money, because that's what he does for a living. But anyway, I got invited to this forum, and you know, it was before I realized I was a pension expert, so I was a little worried about it. I was feeling like, geez, I'm going to go up against this guy whose whole thing is to you know, 
spout this venom about pension plans? Will I be able to do a good enough job defending uh, this plan? And what I realized after having done it is, you know what? You just have to know a little bit of principle and speak back truth to power. He was just spewing inaccuracies and it was easy enough to unspin that. And what was interesting about that forum, attended by a couple of hundred people in Waterloo, most of whom were not our members in trade unionists at all, what was particularly interesting about that was that after that forum, a number of people talked to me, I mean like 20 or 30, and said, thanks, like no one's ever said some of this stuff before, because I, I tried to point out the benefit of having income security in retirement for all of us, right? I tried to point out how this is not gold-plated, it's kind of crazy. I tried to point out that the issues of the plan being not so well-funded now had nothing to do with uh, anybody other than Mike Harris who de de you know, deprived it of contributions, etc. Uh, but I really did, really did focus as well on our obligation to not just be talking about our own pension plans, but instead to be talking about the Canada Pension Plan for all of us for all people in our country, because everybody should have retirement security. It is another thing that I am glad to say our movement, the labor movement, certainly engaged uh, in some fashion about that, but uh, not enough. Uh, and we aren't spending time enough talking to one another, not just even across unions. Look, we had, uh, be quite honest with you, the very first discussion at the National Executive Board about the various pension challenges in different regions of the country just in our own union, never mind between unions. So, you know, it was said before, but it is absolutely true that we haven't yet created enough spaces for us to have these discussions and to really strategically think about from a place of principle. Let's start from a place of principle as trade unionists. What are we doing here? what has happened and what should happen. Is there a way, and maybe it's because I, you know, I have been accused of having rosy colored glasses and I don't mind that accusation, but I have to believe that even in the sickness of capitalism, there is a way that we could use pooled workers' money to do good things instead of bad. I have to believe that. We are not necessarily in a place where we control our plans to a place where we can actually do that today, but we could be if we put our minds to it in a different way. It would be a long process. We've already lost a bunch of ground. This is really the tug and pull uh, between uh, sort of, you know, are you leaning more toward the capitalist side of the question around pensions, or are you leaning more toward the socialist side, if there is one, about pensions? And I think that our obligation is to keep pulling uh, back to that left side, as it were, to help people to see it. It's a tough road to hoe. A number of our people have been, you know, uh, operating in a system for a very long time where they have now become acculturated to it. Uh, and we have uh, to deprogram them. <laughs> they, they could do it with other cults, they can do it with pensions. Um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and we must also not just do this, we have to focus on our plans, we have to focus on what has been built. Our union's celebrating our 50th anniversary this year, and you know, 50 years ago, there were so many things that were different, eh? Like so many things that were different. Uh, women who got pregnant in the workplace were fired often, and you know, there was, it was illegal for most of, the, most of our healthcare members who are now in our union, it was illegal for them to organize. I mean, there's so many changes that have come because unions have organized and made things that ultimately became the norm for all of us. Uh, so we must be able to defend what we have built by way of the workplace security and these pension plans. But we can't ever and only be focused on that. Because that is not, remember the place of principle? <laughs> Our movement has never really ever been about only QP members or only uniform members. We're supposed to be in a working class movement, the labor movement, that is all about all workers, all of us. That is our place of principle. How do we spend more time and energy getting ourselves back to that? And I have lots of confidence that with a number of us speaking to each other and making plans to do it, we'll be able to do that in some fashion for sure. It'll take some time, but you know, we've got lots of time on our hands, right? I do, I'm very young. So <laughs> I'm looking forward 
to the future of uh, a, a young expert indeed. Okay, so I'm done? Okay, thanks. <laughs>